it's very easy to take the humble atom for granted. But in a universe where most particles are mercurial, fleeting, transient, atoms are an island of relative stability held together by the nuclear force. The nuclei of all atoms, except hydrogen, consist of combinations of protons and neutrons, combinations without which we would not be here. However, that realization begs a question. Why is there no periodic table based on nuclei made of only protons or only neutrons? Sure, positively charged protons might repel one another and become unstable, but such a caveat hardly applies to neutral neutrons. If a proton and a neutron in a pair known as a deuteron are more stable together than when they're free, stable enough to form the nucleus of deuterium, heavy hydrogen, then why can't two neutrons bind together to make a stable bound state, a di-neutron? Why does our universe permit stable bound states of protons and neutrons, but seem to firmly forbid stable di-protons, or even more puzzlingly, stable di-neutrons? It's a question that dates all the way back to 1926, when German chemist Andreas von Anthropov coined a term for a mythical element with no protons in its nucleus and no orbiting electrons. He called it neutronium. Such an element would have an atomic number of zero and he placed it in pride of place at the head of the periodic table. The elusive element zero, nu or minus. However, von Antropov's speculative material has steadfastly remained in the world of science fiction. McKay, my sensors indicate that the ground around the mass is rich with neutronium. Neutronium? It's the base raw material to replicate ourselves. Stable, bound states of all protons or all neutrons do not exist, despite extensive searches. However, it turns out that they almost exist. And if the laws of our universe were even slightly different, they certainly would. And if they did exist, there's a strong possibility that we would not. So, why are there no bound states only of protons or only of neutrons? Well, when two nucleons attempt to bind together, quantum mechanics dictates that well-defined discrete energy levels exist in the combined system. This is just like a hydrogen atom a simple bound state of a proton and electron, which has numerous energy levels in which the electron can sit. The nucleons can sit in these energy levels. The lower they sit, the lower the energy of the overall system. If the overall energy of the two bound nucleons is lower than the energy of the individual nucleons, the system will be bound. Since energy is always conserved, energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation is released when nucleons bind together. When a proton and neutron bind together to form a deuteron, roughly 2.2 mega electron volts is released. In order to break the deuteron apart again, a similar amount of energy must be pumped back into it. This is the binding energy of the deuteron. However, there's something fundamentally different in the manner in which combinations of protons and neutrons and clusters of only neutrons and only protons can occupy their energy levels. Protons and neutrons have an intrinsic property called spin. Both nucleons are spin one-half particles that mark them out as fermions. Spin one-half particles can be spin up or spin down. And there's a fundamental rule of quantum mechanics that applies to fermions, the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle states that two identical fermions can never occupy an identical quantum state at the same place and at the same time. It's the principle that allows compact stellar remnants like white dwarfs and neutron stars to hold themselves up against gravity. Matter can only be compressed so much before the Pauli exclusion principle pushes back. 
When two nucleons bind, the configuration that will be the most stable is if both nucleons occupy the ground state, the lowest energy level of the system. This is the configuration that sits lowest in energy. When a proton and a neutron bind, both nucleons can theoretically occupy the ground state of the system with their spins aligned or anti-aligned. The Pauli exclusion principle does not forbid either of these configurations as the proton and neutron are not identical fermions. However, despite this theoretical insight, you will never ever see a spin zero deuteron where the spins of the proton and neutron are anti-aligned. All the deuterons we have ever measured and ever seen either have both their proton and neutron spin up or both spin down. This observation might not seem like much, but it tells us something incredibly important. The binding energy between two nucleons is highly dependent on the relative spins of those two nucleons. So the nuclear force clearly depends on the spin of the nucleons attempting to bind. And it turns out that if the nucleons have their spins aligned, their binding energy is stronger. The system sits lower in energy and it's easier to form a bound state. However, if the particles have spins anti-aligned, the binding energy is weaker. The system sits higher in energy and that makes it more difficult to form a bound state. Or, in the case of the proton and neutron, impossible. Otherwise, we would detect deuterons with anti-aligned spins, and we do not. It turns out that when both a proton and a neutron are in the ground state with spins aligned, we can form a bound deuteron. However, if the spins of the proton and neutron are opposite, it is impossible to form a bound deuteron. The energy of the system is too high and the system cannot bind. Now watch what happens when we try to bind together two protons or two neutrons, two identical fermions. If you try to place two identical fermions in the same lowest energy ground state, the Pauli exclusion principle demands that their spins cannot be identical to one another they must be opposite. However, as we saw in the case of the deuteron, these anti-aligned spins increase the energy of the system, and they increase it to such an extent that proton-proton and neutron-neutron pairs, just like the spin anti-aligned deuteron, do not bind. Just as in the case of the deuteron, these anti-aligned spins increase the energy of the system to such an extent that proton-proton and neutron-neutron pairs do not bind, just like the spin anti-aligned deuteron cannot. Of course, electrostatic repulsion between two positive protons makes it even harder for two protons to bind. But that isn't the showstopper. Rather, it's the deep quantum mechanics and Wolfgang Pauli's brilliant insight that is the undoing of identical nucleon binding. Of course, if we can't bind diprotons or dineutrons, then we have no hope of making even more complicated systems of more protons and more neutrons. So we now understand why diprotons and dineutrons do not bind together. However, we still need to check that our theoretical insights from quantum mechanics align with the universe in which we live. Our insights would fall apart instantly if it turns out that we can produce stable states of protons or neutrons in the laboratory. However, this is something we have never been able to do. As far back as 1952, years before we fully understood the true origins of the nuclear force, experimentalists started searching for states like the dineutron the bound state of two neutrons. However, efforts such as those overseen by physicist Bernard Cohen constantly ended in failure. More recent searches have shown that temporary, 
unstable resonant states of multiple neutrons can form. In the 2010s, nuclear physicists at the Amande Neutron Facility in France bombarded the rare earth element terbium with high energy deuterons and created a temporary excited state that quickly decayed. Careful interrogation and spectroscopy of the state and its decay products found that the state was consistent with being an unstable bound state of two neutrons, a di-neutron. 2022 brought a highly statistically significant observation of a tetra-neutron state, an alpha particle made only from neutrons, four of them. An incident beam of helium-8 nuclei, a heavy isotope of helium, was fired at a tank of helium-4. The four additional neutrons in helium-8 are weakly bound and easily removed in the collision, momentarily combining to form an unstable tetra-neutron state. Turning to the diproton, despite being a fleeting, unstable state, the diproton plays a more vital role than most can imagine. In the hearts of stars, protons are constantly slamming into one another and forming temporary diproton states. The diproton is a higher energy system than two free protons on their own, and hence, it's more massive. This means that a temporary diproton state can either simply fall back apart into two separate protons that continue rattling around inside the core of the sun, or occasionally decay to a deuteron, a positron, and an electron neutrino. A vanishingly small fraction of the diprotons created in the sun, about one in 10 to the 28, follow the second path and form a deuteron. However, this process is the primary way by which the sun makes deuterium, the first step in the proton-proton chain that powers the sun and nearly all stars. Without the temporary diproton, life on Earth could not exist. So it seems that under the right conditions, temporary diproton or di-neutron states can exist. However, these temporary states are incredibly fleeting and without the binding energy needed to hold them together, they fall apart quickly. Experimental searches so far have confirmed that there are no stable states of only protons or only neutrons. Of course, there are some extreme conditions under which we expect bound, stable states of neutrons to be not only likely, but inevitable. There is a place where nucleons are crushed so tightly that gravitational forces can help bind them for more than a fraction of a second. That place is inside a neutron star. Here, the gravitational force adds additional binding energy to the insufficient nuclear binding energy provided by the nuclear force. And neutron bound states become inevitable. So bound, Stable states of all neutrons can exist, but only under the most extreme conditions. They cannot remain bound for long outside the hell of an ultra-dense stellar fragment. The nuclear force just isn't strong enough. However, that begs another question. How much stronger would the nuclear force need to be such that bound states of only protons or only neutrons could exist? And what would be the implications of their existence, if any? The first part of this question was addressed theoretically by English cosmologist, theoretical physicist, and mathematician, John Barrow, when considering the impacts of hypothetical extraspatial dimensions on Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the production of the universe's first nuclei within minutes of the Big Bang. Barrow calculated that if the strength of the strong coupling constant, the dimensionless constant that determines the strength of the strong nuclear force, was just 9% greater, di-neutrons would be stable, and we would be building another periodic table of bound neutron states. At 13% stronger than the present value, diprotons and other bound states of solely protons would also be able to exist. 
The production of all neutron and all proton bound states might not seem like a particularly profound or consequential occurrence. So we have a few more bound states to deal with and catalog, so what? But it could have made all the difference in the universe. If stable dineutrons and diprotons had formed in the early universe, we might not even be here to ask why they formed. The stars that seed the universe with the heavy elements from which we are made, iron, carbon, calcium, are powered by the fusion of hydrogen fuel. But if bound states of only protons were stable, most hydrogen in the early universe could have combined to form diprotons, helium-2 nuclei, and there goes huge fractions of our hydrogen stellar fuel. In 2009, cosmologists MacDonald and Mullen calculated that if the strong nuclear force were 50% higher, bound states of all neutrons or all protons would actually have come to dominate the universe and there would be no hydrogen left in the aftermath of the Big Bang. The universe would be a much different, much darker place. The first stars would never have ignited. Without stars, there would be no supernovae or collisions of neutron stars to seed the cosmos with heavy elements. Without those heavy elements, we, beings of stardust, would not exist there would be no one here to peer through the gloom. So it turns out that unstable diprotons are essential to the processes that power life on this planet. But stable diprotons and dineutrons could have ensured such life never began at all. Some see a fluke of nature in the binding strength of the strong nuclear force. Others see a fine-tuning of the laws of our universe and the hand of God tweaking the cosmos to ensure our creation and flourishing. The question of why there are no proton or neutron-only bound states might initially seem inconsequential, a poke at a trivial oddity of our universe. But we now see that it is far more profound. It's a fascinating question that reaches deep into the heart of nuclear physics, draws on the deep fundamental tenets of quantum mechanics and touches on the very nature of our universe and our existence within it. The path that led to our existence is far more narrow than we often appreciate. I want to know what you think because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment if you wish to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.